Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel. Um, I'm a security researcher at Fraunhofer FKAE in Germany. I also do some teaching at the University of Bonn. And my work scope usually is analysis of malware in general, reverse engineering, and analysis automation. I had a chance to present a couple times at BotConf before, and I'm very happy to be back here, um, since this is absolutely one of my favorite conferences, and thank you to the organizers for running it every year. So what am I going to talk about? Um, as Eric already said, it's going to be about a framework for code similarity analysis and um, for the structure of the talk. I first want to give a short motivation how I ended up doing that, then talk about the system itself, the algorithms that are used for code similarity and how the framework is structured. Um, I'm talking about the framework in particular because we are sharing all of this as uh, open source as well. And then I'm going over some use cases that I see for this type of analysis um, and do some case studies to motivate them, and then give an outlook on what we, where we want to go from the, the stage where we already are. So for, for the motivation, uh, who remembers this? So this has been a couple years ago already, so it was 2017. Um, this is a famous WannaCry, um, probably one of the most impactful, vulnerable uh, exploits, weaponized on ransomware in the last couple of years. It had so much impact that everyone was probably wondering who was responsible for that. So this, this question of attack attribution was uh, very important. And then there was this tweet. Who, who knows about this tweet? I mean, if you, if you post some hashes and addresses, I'm, I'm super curious. Um, so I went and looked at it at the time. And if you look at it in particular, you see this. So OK, those functions look very similar. And the interesting thing here is one of them is WannaCry, and the other one is a, another family called Contopy that has been covered by Symantec before. Um, it was attributed to Lazarus. So this was a clear pointer towards, that yeah, might be Lazarus. We are not sure yet. Um, but I was completely impressed by um, basically this, this, because it was pretty quickly after the attack. And um, I, I told myself I want to be able to do that as well. And I, I tried to figure out a, a way to maybe uh, get into a position to, to find such links uh, quickly. And even today, um, many of the basic blocks found, shown in this function are basically unique, still all across Malpedia, which is for more than 1,500 different malware families. So if you are able to basically f find and pit pinpoint such blocks, it might be really interesting to discover links that you are not assuming or know about. So code similarity analysis in general, I think, has very high potential to help analysis um, to accelerate their analysis. Um, I've been using Bindiv for almost 15 years now, I think, and that has been always been one of my go-tos, be it for transferring labels between either uh, IDBs and everything like this, or just comparing things. And um, my feeling is most of the existing solutions that are available are rather one-to-one -one com um, comparisons. So Bindiv, like I said, or Diaphora, which is another excellent open source tool in that context. Um, so you can only compare two binaries. And most of the other solutions that would enable you to do one against many are proprietary. So there are some companies that are offering services like that, or they are not fully open source, at least. So I thought, hey, let's see what we can do here. So this is where mCrate is coming in. So my goal was basically to analyze code sharing um, as well as the use of third-party libraries in malicious software. Because if we are able to sort out those libraries, we might not have to look at all of the functions. We can. Uh, shape our focus towards the more interesting parts, and um, sometimes even the reuse of third-party libraries uh, can be interesting. Um, so, on another hand, um, I wanted to create another tool that basically enables you to interact better with uh, Malpedia. So, my feeling, I don't get a lot of feedback for Malpedia. Um, it's, I guess most people are just using the library and looking uh, at what is basically published in blocks and stuff like that. But uh, I'm way more a fan of the binary corpus that's below it. And I thought, OK, maybe if I start providing another tool that allows you to interact with the corpus itself, um, people get uh, additional good ideas what to do with it. And um, for this project that I'm going to talk about, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, basically. Um, there's so much research on code similarity analysis already that I wanted to reuse some of the proven techniques that are there. So for the requirements, what I wanted to have is um, a similarity measure that um, is first reliable and then interpretable, so you can still understand why functions are matched to each other. It should at least scale into tens of millions of functions. So that's not you pile everything that you have in there, but you still rather want to work on uh, a, a data set that you have some knowledge and ideas about. So basically having labels on it um, comes really 
in well for some of the additional functionality that I'm going to talk about. And um, another thing that I was aiming for is um, if you're indexing a function, what's the average size of a function? Let's say 80 bytes. You don't want to do indexing that is like 10 times the size of the function, because otherwise you cannot achieve scalability. And um, at least at the time when we started working on that, at, for me it was not a high priority to do uh, cross-business or cross-architecture. If you look at many of the academic research on the topic, they are mostly interested in vulnerability discovery or rediscovery and uh, cross-architecture in particular. Mapedia, especially at the time when we started working on that, was still a lot of 32-bit code, so I rather wanted to uh, focus on 32-bit uh, Intel. So, how does it work? Um, there's a very good survey paper on code similarity um, research by um, Milfen Haag at, and Caballero, I think. And they said, basically, you have more than 50 papers on code similarity published uh, since 2010. So there should be a lot where you can look and get some ideas on, on what you want to do. However, if you look at how many of them are doing malware stuff, it's, it's getting narrower. And there's only one that basically ever looked at um, how is um, free and open source library usage uh, found in malware and how can we work with that? So I thought, okay, there's still some room to do uh, in, in this regard. So MCRIT, the tool that I'm talking about, basically combines quasi-identical and fuzzy code matching. Um, quasi-identical is really good because um, most of the statically linked code will be linked in the very exact same fashion, so that helps you to um, sort that out really quickly. And the other one is um, always useful if code has been slightly modified or recompiled in order to find something there as well. So uh, we are aiming for both the basic block and the function level with this, at least for the um, quasi-identical thingy. And overall, we want to do efficient one-to-many matching. So um, is that what I basically meant. You want to have one sample that you're interested in, you slap it against the, this uh, service, and then you get a response, where does this have similarity in all of the different things that have been matched. And the techniques used here are, on the one hand, hash maps, because they are very um, efficient with uh, access, and locality-sensitive hashing, in particular minhash, um, in order to also speed up the, the fuzzy part. Um, there are several co-authors, so for this presentation it's mostly Manuel and Daniel, uh, but I also want to mention Paul and Stefan who helped me with my earlier research on the um, evaluation prototype that I used in my uh, PhD thesis. So the overall workflow is something like this. As input, you might have shell code, you might have an XC, could be a PE file, could be an L file, a program library. Uh, you first disassemble that, so you get the functions, and then you do the indexing. So on the one, card, uh, one hand, what you want to do uh, in this tip is that you want to wildcard all of the uh, addresses in there, because um, if your code is basically a memory dump and you're to ASLR or loading, it might be anywhere in the memory, you have static addresses in there, and they basically just screw up the matching for you. And if you wildcard those, or, or basically if code was reused, um, you, you have a way better chance to um, find the code again. Yeah, so this is our quasi-identical representation, and we put it in a database. And uh, for the min hashing, you, you need a way to describe the functions. And for me, that's token and metrics-based features. Um, I'm going to talk about them in a minute, and then you throw them into min hashing and also put that in your database. So in more detail, this position-independent code hashing is a technique that has been described in 2009 by the fine folks of CERT-CC. And um, they basically found out that you, if you have a large amount of code, you can drastically reduce um, the number of unique functions that you have in there. And I thought, okay, that is something that I want to do as well. Um, the two functions that you can see here, just by the first glimpse, you would say they are similar to each other, right? So they look very similar, it's the same amount of blocks, um, the uh, edges look the same, blocks are even the same size, but they're not identical. So there are some slight differences in there, and with the pick hashing, we basically index the whole function, and if, even if there's basically some slight differences, like in stack use or something like this, you get another hash. So um, it really is for exact reuse, basically. So how does this pick hashing work? We use the instruction bytes here. And as I said, for example, here on the stack, we have a reservation of 134 hex bytes. We might end up with this hashing procedure with this number. Um, what we're using here is basically just a prefix of the SHA-256 representation. If we hash the other function, we have a different hash. So this is sad, but we don't need to do anything about it because, like I said, it's still a very good technique if you want to do um, recognition of statically linked code because that is basically always exactly the same. We're also doing this on basic block level. So this is uh, where it's getting a bit more interesting. 
again, it might happen that your blocks are not the same, but you at least have a higher chance that there are maybe even already blocks that are the same. And even those can be good indicators where to look at. And the whole idea of this framework is to point you towards those blocks in the first place. So this is um, some good um, technique if you want to identify um, candidates for potential code reuse. So what's minhashing? Um, ultimately, it's an um, algorithm that does um, independent permutations in a sense that it allows you to do really fast um, an estimate of set similarity. What is set similarity? Say you have two sets here, one is C1 and C2, and they have some overlap, in this case uh, the circle and also the pentagon, and they have some different parts in there. Um, there's basically the Jacquard similarity coefficient that gives you a measure on how similar those two sets are. And normally you would take the same parts and divide them by the amount of um, different elements that you can observe in there in total. So our two, uh, two sets here would have a uh, Jacquard similarity of uh, 0.5. Um, it's very scalable. Um, it still allows us to do um, those sing single lookups also in logarithmic time, which is really good because that means that um, when we are later doing this one-to-many lookup, we don't have to throw all of our functions against all of the other ones, but we can limit ourselves to candidates that we really only want to match with that. And um, because of those reasons, it has been used in the past, for example, for the indexing or similarity analysis on, on text documents. I think it was also the original um, technique that was used in the Alta Vista search engine, for example, and had found many different applications later on, like in genome sequencing, and also um, I think in 2012 was the first time it was used for, for code analysis. Yeah, so how are we doing this in particular? Here's another function, and uh, now we want to index this one using minhashing. As I said, we, we can do tokens. So if you think that code is more or less like a text document, then your instructions could be words in there, right? And if you want to say two of them might be similar, it's, it's likely that you have similar instruction sequences in here. And that's basically what we're doing here. We're taking um, those sequences of instructions, like this uh, push ESI, move ESI something, push ESI, then the next one, move ESI, push ESI, call, and um, put them into these, this, uh, these smaller bits. And we also do some abstraction, because um, for instructions, you can typically say, OK, if it's a move, then it's interacting somehow with memory. If it's push or pop, then it might be interaction with stack. There might be arithmetic instructions. And this basically helps that you um, introduce some fuzziness that um, will allow you to do those not exact matches, but more um, what you would call similar but not identical matches. So this is um, a lot of those abstractions that we are doing here. And then ultimately, what since it's called min hashing, we use a set of different hash functions. We pick the smallest value of those, and we basically can generate this sequence that's describing our function this way. So for each of the functions, we are able to define this uh, unique fingerprint. Um, the other range of features that we are using, um, my thought was okay, um, or that has been used in literature a lot, is that you describe a function statistically. You can say how many calls are in this function, how large is the largest basic block, um, how many call or uh, control flow instructions are in there, how large is the stack that's being used, and um, if we're using those exact values, we don't have any fuzziness. So we, we need to represent it in a way that those values become matchable again. And um, one way to do that, for example, is quantization. So if I have a maximum block size, for example, of 14, I would probably also want another function that has a largest block of 13 or 15, so that the neighbors. And what we can basically do is, um, with this quantization, throw them into buckets, so they will be matched later on. And after this procedure, we basically end up with tokens, again, that are similar to the ones that I've shown before, and we do the same thing of hashing, selecting the representation, and can add that to our sequence as well. So ultimately, we will have this numerical sequence that is describing our function in a more abstract fashion. And now our hope is, if we use that on similar functions, a lot of this representation will create an overlap. So for example, we have two different functions here. One has this, uh, this uh, sequence that's shown here. This is the other sequence, and I've highlighted basically all of the positions where we uh, ended up with the same values. And just like I've explained with the Jacquard similarity, we can count how many of them are exactly the same and divide them through the length of the signature. And in this case, we would end up with a similarity score of 75%.
Now, I, I told you basically you don't want to match your function against your whole corpus because um, just for an example, say you have a malware sample that contains 700 functions. Uh, the database that I will later be using will be having 7 million functions. And you now would have to compare everything against everything else that it's already 5 billion comparisons. So this completely explodes the larger your data is. And this is where another technique of, of min-hashing basically comes in, which is uh, banding. So this is basically the idea if you already have similar subsequences even in your min hash, we can use that for indexing as well. Because if those subsequences are the same, it's more likely that the whole thing will be the same. And this allows us to basically determine candidates for the function matching that we later on have to do. So basically you spend some extra um, storage or memory in order to have very good candidate selection. Okay, so there has been a lot of work going into um, deciding how those features would look like. I'm not going to go into details here. That's um, basically from my PhD thesis that has been published in the meantime. One idea was basically just um, to, uh, along those numerical features, to find those that are not correlated to each other. Because if you think uh, the number of basic blocks is probably very highly correlated with the number of edges that your function might have, and, and so on. Or the nesting depth and the function complexity, that different measures that are, that are uh, at least in the uh, expressiveness, not really valuable to use uh, in parallel. So we did some optimization here and ended up with the parameters that I've more or less just shown to you. Now, how can you basically work with that and interact with the system? So um, you can, like I said, we have some indexing on basic block level, on function level, on whole sample level. Um, you could query with all of those um, elements, basically. Let's, let's take a function, for example. We have this function, and now we have to ask the system, which in turn will ask the database. What's in our database? Um, Melpedia, <laughs> for example. Uh, but also some open source reference code. So it could be the um, Visual Studio runtime, because that's something that, um, if you're using IDA, for example, uh, you always want to be, have uh, sorted out, and IDA is automatically letting, uh, adding labels there with uh, its FLIR technology already. Um, similar things for, for Ghidra, for example. Uh, but you might have custom libraries that you want to add in there as well. And maybe also some new malware that you have not labeled yet and you want to figure out what it is or later on want to cluster. And if we query the system now with a single function, the response will typically be something like this. So it will tell you um, after typically fractions of a second in which other malware samples um, this function was matched with a score of typically more than 50 or 65 percent. And the interesting thing that you now can do is you can basically look at in how many different malware families have I found something like this. This basically gives you an idea of the frequency, um, how often this function exists across what we define as malware families. And this we can use for our advantage because it, on the one hand, allows us to introduce weights because functions that are rare are probably more interesting to us or give us a better indication that it's related to a certain malware family. Or they might be even unique. And those are then characteristic for a certain family, so might be good for identification later on as well. Yeah. And what we can do then is basically aggregate every function match on sample level, and then we end up with uh, this type of scoring where we can use this uh, frequency analysis, so basically valuing those parts or matches that are less common, higher, to get higher frequency scores, or even those unique scores, which typically are already a very good indication at what member family we might be looking at. Okay. So... Um, as I said, we are going to release that, how is the, the whole system basically built. First off, we need a database. At the time, we decided to, this to be MongoDB. Um, the, there's an interface for it, so if you ever want, uh, feel the need that it has to be some uh, relational database, you could possibly adapt that as well. Um, the core of the system really is this MCRIT server, which is your interaction interface. It's basically an REST API server that provides you the capability of indexing, um, but also to generate matching jobs, because um, those typically take at least a couple seconds, so they should be handled asynchronously um, in, the, in the backside of the system with using a queue. And that's what those workers are for. You can have multiple of them in parallel. They're also using um, all of your CPU cores if you want so. And um, they basically, this, this whole backend is producing those results for you. 
in order to interact with the system, you've already seen some screenshots. Um, there's also a web UI, um, which is um, also Python-based and, and Flask, and is talking to the REST API, essentially. And um, for this, we also wrote a Python client library um, that you can use to also directly interact with the um, backend server. For good measure, we also threw in uh, a HTTP reverse proxy in there um, to basically just simplify if you want to host it with um, TLS or any other encryption enabled. Yeah, so all of this is basically just a single Docker Compose. If you want to run this framework at home, if you want to, or at work, um, it's basically just cloning the repo, doing one Docker Compose up, and then it should be up and running. At least for me, that worked a couple of times, and then, um, I've been trying to, to do that now for half a year, even with the updates, and um, I managed to not break my system. So I'm, I'm confident that this is, this is a good idea. All right, so how can you interact with that? Um, first off, this web interface, obviously you can use uh, the browser for that. Um, this MCRIT client also has basically a command line interface that allows you to use um, some of the main features, like throwing new samples into the database, um, or, or exporting data, importing data, and those kind of things. And currently I'm also developing an, an IDA plugin that basically, um, whenever you look at a function, tells you what are similar functions to the function that I'm currently looking at, and do I have labels available for that. And let's have a look at that basically in action. So the second part of this presentation is more or less intended to be a live demo. So the system itself looks like this. And what's been shown there is basically, um, if you load in a data set like Mypedia, you essentially um, have all of your families listed as, as neat entries here, and then you can start basically from here, even diving deeper into them. Um, you, you might have all the samples for those, those different families. This, on the next hand, at some point takes you to function level. Uh, let's have a function that's more interesting. It's not that small. Yeah, like this one. And it can also render the CFG for you. So you basically have a little bit of uh, assembly exploration directly in your browser looking at the function. And what's also almost possible in real time is that it tells you which of the basic blocks is found in how many other um, families in that part. So here we, for example, have 18 families. To me, that would be likely an indication that it's not rare code. It's probably coming from some library or um, from other open source that was just compiled into this Melva sample, for example. The second part, essentially, is we want to do queries for anything against anything else. So um, I've prepared an example for that. You might have uh, heard that the Conti group um, lost their source code last year, let's put it that way, and that enabled other people to basically reuse um, this source code. Say what I wanted to do, say exactly about that. Um, yeah, so there was news about it basically that uh, stated that the log bit group started to um, generate a new variant that is reusing basically the Conti source code. And I was interested in can the system basically tell you that it's reuse of the Conti source code? How similar is it? Do we even maybe find some more stuff? So I took the sample that was referenced there. At the time, the database had run about 6,000 unpacked MEVA samples for 1,400 families, 7 million functions, like I said. And the disassembly plus matching typically takes around 30-ish seconds, so that's 700 functions in that case. And with the results, we can now see that there's three families matching. So it's not just Conti, but two more families. Uh, anyone has an idea why? Well, there have been copycats before. So um, both of the other ones also basically recycle the source code even before that. And um, that's, that's why we get multiple hits here. Um, I've also generated this graphical representation. Um, if you're using or have been using IDA a lot, you, you might know that there's this blue bar typically at the top, right? Um, I'm very, or let's say not very, but a bit unhappy that it's just one dimension, and I thought you can possibly do something cooler with that. And this is at least in the same spirit. And um, each of the bars that you can see here, divided by the black blocks, is one of the functions. So you at least get an idea of how large the function is as well. And the coloring basically acts like a heat map. The blue colors are basically uh, 
the dark blue is, for example, it was only matched in one other family. Light blue is two or three families. Green is more common. Red is already very common. And if you see something purple like this, this is likely matched in 64, 128 different families, and it's super common. So um, just by looking at the structure of a binary like this, uh, you get a better idea probably what's happening here in the end. So if, if there's suddenly a block of very common code, that means, okay, that's likely a library. And I probably never want to look at that code because it's um, not unique or interesting to my investigation. And the second row basically tells you that as well. Um, in my demo database, I have versions of all uh, Visual C runtime pre-compiled in all different flags that are possible. And those functions are basically immediately recognized as well. And finally, the last row, so all of them basically have the same structure, as you can also see, tells you what's the best foreign match that we have found for a particular function in here. And if we are looking in uh, where we have matched something, you can basically at then that point get down to, to function level. We have a look, for example, at this 75% uh, functions. We can see that both Conti and Mio, which is one of those copycats, uh, have been matched. And what we can also do is basically play a bit bindiv in the browser and then get this uh, similarity view for this, the two functions that we have seen here with the coloring blue meaning it has an exact match. Um, so even the byte sequence is exactly the same. Green meaning at least the instruction sequences are the same. And red meaning, okay, that's uh, changed too much that I could find a simple match in the, in the other function representation that I have here. And that at least gives you also potentially an idea which functions you want to look at or where in a function you, you want to look at. And uh, later on, I'm at least looking that I also can basically re-implement this type of visualization directly in IDA so you don't have to jump in between the web framework and, and the other thing. So what is this usable for? Well, um, I guess one idea would be if you have a malware that you don't know which family it might be, your YAR rules have not triggered on it or whatever, you could just query the system with it to, to get the close best um, possible match for it in order to get an idea of what it might be. So malware identification is certainly one use case and uh, library usage detection as well. Yep, so that's what I've shown you. So basically it means the same. We typically see in, in the uh, upper address part of binaries, we will typically see those libraries. The, the front part in, in many times contains the intrinsic code for the, for the family that we really want to look at. And, um, can also look at the functions itself. Now, since we already have all of the code indexed, what else can we do with that? In uh, 2019, together with Felix, we presented on Yara Signator, which ba was basically an approach to automatically generate Yara rules, but that was based on instruction engrams. So we basically also used the disassembly, um, but disregarded the structure. And the approach basically is, if I have all of this index and available, I can look at which instruction sequences are only happening um, in, in certain families. And it's probably a good idea to use these parts to automatically generate Yara rules. So that's what we've been using and uh, doing there. And we can do the same basically with this framework now as well. Um, take, for example, Melva family Ramcos that we also heard about yesterday, I think. Um, what we now can do is basically generate this unique block report. So what this gives us is um, all of the basic blocks that are only found across all of our Ramcos samples and in none of the other Melva samples. Um, there's also statistic, basically, which of the samples contains most of the unique code. So sometimes happens that you are looking at a Malva family, you mostly have those regular release builds, and suddenly there's a debug build, and this might stand out because it's having more unique blocks compared to the other ones, for example. And ultimately, what this feature also gives you is um, this YAR rule generation, and for that it uses all of the uniquely identified blocks for the family that you're looking at. So um, what it does here is basically it looks at in how many different samples have I found this certain uh, basic block here, and it also pre-renders it in the escaped representation that you could use in uh, Yara. And um, basically, a reference to your presentation, uh, Dominica, I'm, I'm basically I've aimed for favoring those uh, sections that at least will have one four-byte uh, atom in the end. That's not zero. Yeah, and ultimately. This, the scoring allows us to do um, a little approximation for the multi-cover uh, multi multi problem and minimize the number of um, basic blocks we need to select in order to basically cover every sample. I think in this way it's um, with seven, no, ten different 
basic blocks. So uh, all of RAM costs can be covered with 20 blocks. And the reason for that is 20 is 2 times 10. Why? OK, there's another view, for example. Um, if you look at RAM costs or the RAM cost representation in Mypedia, you'd see that two big clusters. So um, RAM costs, I guess, had a rewrite when they entered version number three. This is uh, this, this clustering block down here, and all of the other versions before. And this is why we need to select more code in order to cover the newer RAM cost versions uh, along the, the older versions, basically. Yes, now I'm already so showing you the next um, feature, basically, which is a cross-compare uh, across a range of samples that you have pre-selected. And this matching matrix again, this time um, red means less matched, blue means more matched, um, also gives you an idea where there were higher development jumps in the evolution of a certain Melva family. So um, maybe there were new features introduced, there was refactoring, and this, this might give you at least an idea which pairs of Melva samples in this undefined blob that you would otherwise or collection that you might have there uh, want to look at in more specific ways. Yeah, that's once again navigatable, so you can click them and then basically get the same result for a one-to-one -one match that's based on the one against everything that we already had before. Okay, so we had this. Now finally, um, in the motivation I was talking about WannaCry. So I wanted to see, can I reproduce basically the findings that I had and present it in the street? So coming back to this, and um, well, the idea here is what we want to do is identify functions that are used in few other functions. So at least they have to be used in, in other functions. And we can go back to this diagram that I've already showed. So this is for this uh, specific WannaCry sample that has been referenced in this tweet. And if we look closer, and especially look closer at the different matches that we have here, uh, we suddenly realize that there are matches to more families than just Contropy. Um, and those of you that are familiar with the specific threat actor here, you will recognize probably some of the other names as well. So Romeos is a, a short handle for uh, the Romeo Sierra, the Sierra part. So mm, some of those samples that had been um, already detailed in the Novetta report, for example. Joanup is another um, family that's specific to this threat actor as far as I know. And this part is really interesting because it's using um, an AS implementation that's at least to the, according to the system only found in, in those two families as well. So that's, even if there's code reuse that might have been public, um, it might be specific because only this actor is, is using it and you cannot find it in other malware families. So that's still probably a good hint here. Yes, and uh, with that, basically, it gives you some capability to do uh, lead generation, I'd say, um, because you can filter the amount of families that um, you want to look at, or different hits um, for families that you want to look at. So those functions that have only matched few other families, and then basically you can go over them and then decide, that's the human part in here, because that's not what the system does for you. You still have to decide, is this function characteristic? Is its functionality characteristic? And uh, in that sense, basically select what um, proof in binary you want to um, base any of your conclusions on. Let's put it that way. Yeah, so this is the function that I initially showed um, from the IDA screenshot, which is from WannaCry and Contropy. And as you can see here, this is also a lot of literal code reuse, which is what the blue is indicating. And all of those blocks indeed are only found into those two families still today. So um, at least if you are looking at sequences of a couple of instructions, they quickly become somewhat unique or unique enough that you can basically say it's, it's likely reuse that's based on the same source code. So the last aspect that I want to talk about is um, there have been many projects that basically aim for uh, label transfer. So um, what's really helpful for an analyst is if I have an idea, I'm looking at a function and it has been analyzed before, I don't want to reanalyze it, obviously, because I'm spending my effort twice. So if I get, get an idea of how this function was named in the past, that's probably really valuable to me. Um, this is a very complex problem if you think about it for a longer time. That's probably the reason why there are so many projects that try to solve that from different angles. And that's absolutely not where I want to go. I want to keep it simple. Um, so my idea is at least, um, if you have renamed stuff in your IDB, or probably there will be a uh, Gidra 
um, integration at some point maybe as well. You can simply upload that for your specific sample that's already in Imcred. So you basically just have an, another tag that was called like that. And later on, due to code similarity analysis, it might show up simply that this is a label that has been given to a similar function before. Um, IDBs are not openly or widely shared, so it's not an issue that there will be too much data to index this way. Um, but we will try to also provide some reference data, at least for, for libraries like OpenSSL, Zlib, and, and many of the other things that you at least sometimes will find in Malware as well. But at least I've, I've been, or at least one of our teams that's doing a bit reversing, I think, was interested to have a functionality like this. So we try to, to at least do that in, in this way as well. All right. That's almost everything already. Um, there are still certainly some limitations for this, what I'm, I've been showing here. Um, this is really just a first version that we are releasing. So everything that I've shown you um, is fully functional, at least from my perspective. Um, but we are not web designers. We are not front-end designers or whatever. It certainly needs some usability improvements. So what I really, for example, would like to have um, for this visual visualization here is uh, that you would be able to click those. Because then you are directly at the potentially interesting function. Um, right now, it's just a PNG. It could be an SVG. Um, but yeah, we, we first have to learn how to craft SVGs from JavaScript, I guess. We'll see. Yeah, but there will be more usability Im improvements in future. Um, and I hope that I also have interested one or two of you uh, to potentially want to use that. So you can provide feedback to me as well. Um, another thing that I want to address and want to solve in the future is um, data exchange. So um, obviously, I can make the core data set of Malpedia available to all of you, but that means that all of you have to index it again. And I don't want us to spend so many cycles doing the same stuff. So um, we are looking at or thinking about ways to distri distribute pre-processed data that's more efficient um, to reuse, so not uh, so much energy is burned this way. Um, for architecture support, as I mentioned right now, it's only Intel 32 and 64 bits. Um, my colleague is already looking at implementing it with .NET as well. And I at least had one or two uh, people also ask for ARM, so maybe this will be coming at some point as well. Yeah, and uh, another thing that I was just, I think, two days thinking about, um, right now we are only indexing using pcash and minhash. But it might make sense to provide additional indexing for other aspects of the code. So uh, which PIs are used, which strings are used in the functions, um, and also um, PENF metadata. We heard about uh, impash or rich header before. So making that available and searchable in there as well sounds like a good idea. OK. With that, I want to summarize. So what I've been presenting to you is uh, MCRIT, which is short for the minhash based Code Relationship and Investigation Toolkit. Um, the idea here was it's a framework for this quasi-identical matching and fuzzy one-to-many code matching uh, in a somewhat efficient way. Um, for me, it's, I guess it's definitely scalable to tens of thousands of binaries, but not the corpora that um, you, you might be having. But then again, you still want to have those labels, and you probably don't have them for all of your samples anyway. Um, there will be a paper on that as well that's um, basically just describing the use cases that I've been going over. And um, for me, at least, that's the, the four main use cases that I see for using it, like this code identification and library filtering, hunting, label transfer. Um, but maybe if you start using it, you might come up with new, no ideas and, and can provide us with feedback. Yes, all of this is already fully open source. It's available on GitHub. And uh, one more thing, if you want to play with the instance that I've been using here in the demo, I have about 30 of those tokens. Um, because I, I cannot host it for all of you. That's uh, compu computationally too expensive. Uh, Manpedia is fine. That's a static website. But this thing actually does cycles. Um, but uh, for at least for, for simple trials and stuff, it's fine. Uh, so come see me after the presentations if you, if you want to play. Um, it's a limited account. You can only upload uh, samples up to one megabyte, I think. Uh, but it works. OK. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Any questions? Thank you for the talk, and it's really great to 
to have this open source framework released. Um, any uh, insight about the hardware requirements to, yeah. so, um, to make it run? This here is running on four cores and I think 16 gigabytes. So it's even likely to run the whole Mapedia thing on a laptop. So um, I guess if you want to throw a lot of stuff at it, you have to have more hardware. I think it's more CPU. It gets you further than RAM even. So I think the uh, because the, the RAM is really only needed for representing of, of candidates, and those are all really batched, so that it shouldn't explode. And CPUs just means faster. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for the. Uh, I think it's a lot of work <laughs> you've done, um, and um, personally, I think. A couple of years back, actually, Talos released... Uh, First. Sorry? First is the yeah. framework. Yeah. yeah, they released uh, the same, like, um, um, min uh, hash LSH with Jacquard distance, but on the command, command lines. Uh, so, and, and that's the tool I tried. It's, it's like, exactly the same, but um, it's running on Apache Spark, and um, I tried it on our environment, and it was, like, so much data that it crushed it, you know, I collect one hour data on the command lines and I think the malware one is much, much better, like looking at the malware code instead of the command lines from the computer's mm -hmm. uh, executions. Um, and the question with this one, so you actually store it in the database and you every time run jacquard distance on the, every like new sample, you just run it on the whole database in order to identify uh, where it matches or yeah, on only the on, um, on, the, on the candidates, basically. So if you do a query, your query sample, you can decide to store it in a database as well, but um, if you don't know what it is, you have to label it afterwards anyway, right? Um, if you do a query, it's handled like those that are indexed already. So it means um, just straightforward disassembly, then generating the min hashes for it, and then you can do the same candidate selection. So um, usually that means not running against everything, but rather one or two percent of the functions that really are close enough so you need to do the actual comparisons. Mm. So this, this uh, candidate selection is what actually keeps it fast. Okay. Yeah. Um, and one another suggestion maybe, have you tried uh, presenting it in a graph so you can uh, have the links and basically connections between different malware, who connects to who, and because um, on the table it's a little bit uh, different. Yes, let me branch out. <laughs> uh, so let's see if I can find that quickly. Um, no, it must be very much in the end, I guess. Da, 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 like this. Um, so that was the reference data set that I used in uh, my, my PhD thesis, and that's everything against everything. And the good thing is even that is not really expensive in a sense, that's only n log n and not n square. And um, shown here is basically every relationship with a similarity with 10 or more. And the, some of the interesting clusters you have there, this is all of the Zeus families, who share a lot of code, for example. The uh, Panda VM Zeus thingy split off at, at a certain point. Um, but those purple and orange ones are the, the ones that um, basically still link those two families. Uh, you have two different Drydex clusters. That's because it's 32 and 64 bit. The system cannot put them together. And uh, even the Fridex one, so the ransomware spun off from Drydex is clustered into the same sample. So it at least works to a certain degree, but you also have those um, trash clusters that are linked together because of OpenSSL, and I was not able to discern it at that point. So that's uh, external plus some other malware in there. Yeah, yeah. so it, it's generally possible. Uh, I think one of the main benefits of this framework is actually to um, lift all of that to a point where you can interact with it. So I think... Um, how I basically built this, this web thing and everything is just my view on how I believe you can use it. But um, you have a client, you can use all of the raw data in different purposes. Okay, that, that's gonna be the last question. Thanks, nice talk. Great research. Um, so I'm going to ask you about attribution. <laughs> you know, like uh, code analysis is used for attribution. Sometimes it's like not really uh, high confidence. 
So what's your criteria to follow um, to give confidence to this code matching and similarities to say, okay, this is quite likely the same thing or the same actor or the same tool or the same origin, basically? Yeah, um, it, it's hard to express confidence in that, that way. Basically, the system is, um, how, how to say, it's, it's just straightforward giving you the result, but you still have to do the inter interpretation in a sense. Um, you can cluster together if I have multiple functions that are linking between two or three families. That's at least a good idea or indication that you might want to look at it, but you still have to decide, is this now really characteristic code that was written by a human and not taken from somewhere or linked for some reason and just rare? Um, so ultimately, it will be a game of statistics. The more quality data you have for reference, the more accurate de automatic deductions you will be able to make. It's, it's really hard to give uh, a good answer otherwise, I think. So we are not jobless yet, so. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>